Well, good day again, folks, and welcome to Mortdale Oakley Baptist Church's sermons online. It's great to see you again. Glad you could join us. Today we begin a new series in our church on the Generosity Project. This is a fantastic resource that we'll be using, and our Sunday sermons will follow along with the Generosity Project. And uh, obviously... The challenge is for us to hear what God's word has to say to us about being generous people. But for Christians, we always begin with God. He is the reason we want to live the way that we live. What he's done for us in the goodness of the gospel of Jesus changes us. One of the things that it does is challenge us to live a generous life. Because God himself is generous. So in the coming weeks, we will think about these things together. And I hope that it's a great encouragement to you and a challenge also. Today, uh, we're beginning with a Bible reading from the book of Acts. And I'll read that and then I'll pray and we'll think about God's word together. The reading is Acts chapter 17 verses 24 to 28, and it's the voice of the Apostle Paul speaking to the Greek philosophers. And he said this in Acts 17 from verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Let's pray. Our great God, we thank you for the gift of your word, revealing to us your character, your deeds done for us, here in this world, for people like us, desperately in need of a reconciliation with you. Remind us today of your generosity toward us and begin to teach us again how we should be changed as a result of who you are and what you've done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one time that famous naughty boy Bart Simpson was asked to say grace when famous Mr. Burns was visiting the Simpson household. Here's what happened. Bart, would you like to say grace? Dear God, we pay for all this stuff ourselves, so thanks for nothing. (gasps) (laughs) Well, in the YouTube comments below this video, somebody said, hey, we're all thinking it, but just said it. Thanks for nothing, God. We provided everything that we've got. I think a lot of us and many Christians feel this way. We might know in theory that God blesses me, But I don't always feel it. It feels like I haven't been given anything. And a lot of the time it feels like I have not been given a lot. So my glass always feels half empty. And I can respond to that feeling usually by being tight-fisted myself. Nobody's given me anything, so... Why should I be concerned to give to other people? 
the median amount of money that Australians give away each year, the average Australian income earner, is $200 a year. <laughs> That's not a lot. The average median Aussie income is something like about $50,000 a year, something like that. And out of that, we give $200 away. Two-thirds of Aussies don't volunteer their time, any of it. And for those that do, the median amount, again, is about an hour a week given away to some other person or some other cause in uh, volunteer work. You may not desire to be a more generous person or to live in a more generous world, but if you do desire it, is there even a reason to be? And can I be a more generous disciple of Jesus and be happy about it? Well, there is a reason and we can be happy about it and it is important that Christians be generous. And certainly I would think more generous than the average Aussie if those statistics are anything to go by. Where do we begin when thinking about generosity? Well, we begin with God. The Bible reveals God to be the generous creator and sustainer of the world and the creator and the sustainer of you. Remember what Paul said in Acts 17. God made the world and everything in it. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all people life and breath and everything else. God did this, verse 27, so people would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. In him we live and move and have our being. God does not need us and we cannot hope to repay him. And yet he gives and he gives. Listen, Bart Simpson. Your dad, Homer, may have paid for the roast chicken down at the supermarket. But what about the air you breathe? The existence of the chicken in the first place to roast. Who made the trees used to make the table you sit at to eat? And the rain that grew those trees. Don't you see? Who made the atoms used at the nuclear power plant that pays Homer's wage? James chapter 1, verse 17 says this. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. It is God who gives the good, and he gives constantly. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 45, that our Father in heaven causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He gives daily to you. He gives beyond anything that is deserved. The generosity of God is a fullness and abundance flowing out from him to you. The only question is, do you see it? Do you feel it? Do you trust it? Once you learn this, you can picture your life very differently as a, a life of receiving. God, like a great waterfall, like Niagara, like Victoria, pours out to you pouring out life, air, sun, rain, food, water, friends, family, laughter. 
a fullness flowing and overflowing to you. A plenitude of gifts. I love that word, plenitude. I am plentifully supplied. He gives. And beyond all this, what is the gospel? It is that God gives himself. He gives himself to you. That you might know and worship him. And God's son Jesus lives his life on earth to save us from judgment. He gives even his life to save us from the penalty of sin. He gives. He pays that price so I can have the living God. He is a generous God. He is not like the other so-called gods. Yes, remember this also. The other gods, as Paul said in Acts 17, verse 25, are served by human hands. They will take from you. And they might choose to bless, or they may not. They make no promise. Whether it is the Aztecs whose mountains of human skulls from their human sacrifice were given to feed the sun god so he might give life in return. Humans have been serving gods like that for a long time. If you bleed for me, say such gods, I may give you something in return. Whether it's the ancient gods or the ones we serve right now, now is not much different. The gods of money, education, popularity, and so on, they say to us, why don't you give me all you've got? Bleed for me, sacrifice for me, and I might choose to give you all the joy and the peace and the purpose you're looking for. Or I may not. It might be gone in a second. And we serve those things all our lives. And they chew us up and they spit us out. That's not our God. Our Savior is not like that. He is so generous to us. When we know this, we begin, or we ought to begin, to live a certain way, a different way. We begin to move through life. We, th we think, we sort of stand differently. We have a certain stance toward life. When we understand these things, knowing this generous God produces a way to receive life itself, to receive the circumstances of life that come our way, to handle them and to think about them and the things of life. And having received those things, to change what we choose to do with them. Jesus taught us in Matthew 6 verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Jesus said, look at the lilies of the field. God clothes them, and you can know he cares for you. So a disciple of Jesus has, has a posture toward life. I'm given to. I'm not shortchanged. I'm blessed. I'm not robbed of what was rightfully mine. Not I earned it all myself. 
But I know that a great open hand has provided for me. It's all around me. The blessing of God. I'm surrounded by it. It's overwhelming. It's miraculous. That's how we move through life. And the difference in these attitudes produce very different personalities and actions. Not greed or complaint or fear, but giving and thanks and trust. Literally look at the sun and say, thank you, Lord God. Do it. Voice it. Say it. Your loaf of bread on the breakfast table. Thank you, Father. There's a ceiling above your head. I'm serious. Look up when you're in bed tonight. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not looking up at the stars right now or sleeping on cold ground or wrapped up in branches. I'm under shelter with warmth. And for my mother, for my child, the help of a teacher, of an uncle, a friend, for that person who cared for me, I give you thanks. I number the blessings. And with this joy in my heart, I have to give. There's so much grace flowing over this waterfall, I have to cup some in my hand and, and give something to someone else somehow. I have to put this goodness somewhere. I have to give. Don't skip over the videos that we've produced for the Thanksgiving offering at our church. What a project. What noble causes. You couldn't spend money more sensibly than on these people and on these projects. The generous God gives, and that makes for grateful hearts. And grateful hearts are busting. They are bursting to open hands and give to another, like our Savior has given to us. Here's an inspiring example of happy open-handedness. I hope you enjoy this short video. I think if you were to ask people the question, is there a homelessness problem in the Northern Beaches? They would probably think no, but there is. Is there abuse in families and people living in hard times? People might be um, asset rich, but cash poor, and they just literally can't get a meal every day. So the community pantry, it's a soup kitchen, I guess. Um, so we're providing a meal. We started in February of 2016. There was a number of people that had a desire in their heart to do something like this, to, to reach um, out from the church community and reach into the, the community and provide some sort of service. It would kind of start around about 3.30. There's a member of church who's developed a program, which we're calling the Food Bank, and he's gone and researched a number of different businesses and providers in the area, and they give him fresh produce every week. And the guests, they'll take away some, some fruit and vegetable, and sometimes, some weeks, you'll come and there'll be clothing. If it's just coming into winter, we'll um, put out blankets and warm clothes, and they kind of get snapped up. The guests usually arrive pretty much by four, even though we don't officially start till five. 
they can grab a cup of tea and um, have a chat. Um, then about five we would serve, serve the meal um, and then that goes on for a couple of hours. They feel a part of the community now, so they come here, like even, even this evening, one guest came and he's had a really tough week. He's been struggling with some anxiety and depression and he's been in hospital under some treatment and he discharged himself today because he said, I need to go down to the community pantry because he just loves associating with people that are now his friends. There's some really cool practical stories like a, a lady that we had who was a, a single mum, a little bit lost in a hard place. Yeah, it was just beautiful to watch this lady. Um, we had somebody that was in like the employment HR side of things that was helping her with a resume, doing interview practice. And we had people who were talking to her about finances and how to deal with it. Um, and it just built her confidence to the point where she got a job and we don't see her at the community pantry anymore. There's close on 80 volunteers. Some have the capabilities and skill sets to do that cooking. Some are just completely comfortable with interacting with the guests and forming relationships with them. And that's what I see is amazing about it is, yeah, all the volunteers and my fellow committee members who just give so much of their time and finances and efforts and focus, yeah. So I think in the first instance, people just wanted to get on board and help in some way. Then I think what we've noticed is as those people have come and served in that way, they get to benefit from it because they get to see um, the fruits. Something you learn as a Christian is that um, we, were, we were undeserving of the love that was given to us and the sacrifice that was made for us. But once you come to the realisation of what you received out of that and the depth of God's love for us in it, then I think Christians just have a different level of motivation for being generous. It's kind of like we have this wellspring of life in us that just bubbles over and we can't keep it in. I guess some people could see a group of Christians outreaching in this way as if it's just an opportunity to try and win people for Christ. I could answer that question in two ways. First is, absolutely, <laughs> but, but not in the sense that it's a strategy to try to win them and to trick them into it. I think in the sense that it's an opportunity for us to be real about sharing God's love for them. And look, if we, if, if we found out in 20 years time that nobody that we served here ended up becoming a Christian, we'd be devastated, but we wouldn't regret the fact that we cared for them at a time that they were in need. I mean, it's our hope and prayer that if this is nothing more than, you know, planting a seed in their heart to think about why these people do that, and we get that question all the time, why do you do this? And it's great, that's the opening for us to say, look, we do this because God loved us and we literally just want to share that with you. Well, that's the grateful heart in action. But we do find it hard, don't we? Why do we? Why does greed seem so easy and generosity seem so hard? What's the matter with us? We have to ask that question and it will help us to answer it. That's next week. For now... Remember God in creation, in salvation, generous, overflowing with generosity. And be moved by God's grace to open your hearts, open wallets, open homes and hands and give. Let's pray. Now, Father, help us to see it right instead of seeing it wrong. 
to see the waterfall of grace, blessing, flowing from you, the generous God, the giving, creator, sustainer, and saviour. And so, our Father, being grateful that that is what the true and living God is like, and that you are not like the gods we invent or imagine, the false gods we choose to follow, knowing these things, change our hearts to be full of gratitude, change the way in which we move through life, to see ourselves as receivers of good things, of what we really need. And in understanding these things, to have our hearts and our hands opened up toward others, how good that will be. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.